This is the end of Battlefield 5. And no, I'm not joking. It is all over. Rip, finito, game over. The end, okay do we. The standalone update this summer is effectively the game's final content update. No D-Day, no Stalingrad, no Berlin, no new factions. I was hoping for a bright turnaround such as Battlefield 4 or Star Wars Battlefront 2. But with this announcement, we can see that that is unlikely that we'll see any such turnaround. Battlefield 5 is such a departure from what Battlefield is supposed to be that perhaps there's something in the decision to simply stop working on it and move on. Try again with the next game. It's clear that whatever kind of magic they injected to the previous games wasn't in their latest title, so. Dice, you simply don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time a new Battlefield comes out. Dice is creating our next Battlefield game with never before seen scale. Hypothetically though, let's say this is a reality and the next Battlefield game is a reboot simply titled Battlefield. Rebooting the franchise in such a fashion, I feel, that would be a massive hit for DICE and EA and a great way to get some of those players that they've lost back into the franchise. Battlefield 6 needs all of the development time that it can get because this franchise cannot survive another undercooked monstrosity like Battlefield 5. Battlefield 2042's development is widely reported to have been a tumultuous time for the team at DICE from the title's conceptual phase to its final stages. Leakers such as Tom Henderson had reported that this game began as a battle royale while ex-DICE developers would state that the title had gone through multiple variation during its conceptual phase with concepts such as a Cold War Gone Hot scenario or a Command and Conquer Renegade inspired title with one large scale map and one game mode where players would be building bases and battling it out. Once DICE decided that the next Battlefield would be following a modern setting, there still wasn't confidence on the exact time frame of the title, with data mines presenting that the game could have been set in 2035. Outside of the setting, DICE had sought out to either expand or reinvent the core pillars of what made Battlefield the juggernaut it is today. A new iteration of the Frostbite engine was being developed, which had aimed to expand the scale of the franchise to accommodate the next generation of consoles being the PS5 and the Xbox Series X, with the early Frostbite showcase in EA Play 2020 presenting an unprecedented scale to both player count and destruction. While the ambition was clear and present, Battlefield 2042 whose development had received major setbacks from multiple fronts. There's been an exodus of talent from DICE with a large number of veterans departing since the launch of Battlefield 5, with many moving to ex-DICE CEO Patrick Soderlund's new studio, Embark. The lack of seniority had led to a multitude of issues on 2042's development from the title's vision to its back-end performance. The leadership for Battlefield 2042 had a wide diversity of backgrounds with veterans such as Larv Gustafsson, who has been working on the franchise since its inception, as well as general manager Oscar Gabrielson who's led the team at DICE since Battlefield 3. Then there's newer leads such as the senior vice president arriving from Activision Blizzard working on the likes of Destiny and Call of Duty as it entered its Warzone era, and then there's the head of design who had no prior experience for a console title, let alone an FPS title, working on the likes of Candy Crush and Minion Rush mobile games. While not one person is directly responsible as game development is a complex pipeline led by a large team of talented individuals, there are enough reports from leakers and alleged playtesters to suggest that the leadership was ignorant throughout Battlefield 2042's development on major issues such as the implementation of specialists and the open-ended level design. Additionally, the lockdown had set new challenges for the gaming industry as a whole, with developers working at home bringing a large amount of restructures of how developers were going to be able to communicate and play test, and it did not help that some of the developers at DICE were reported to not have PCs that were sufficient enough to run the in-development builds of the game. With the short development time of only three years in addition to all the setbacks, it was obvious that things were not going to go well. This battlefield, any way you look at it, is one of the most innovative in the franchise for how much they chose to deviate from their core principles while also expanding the scale. The amount of meetings and playtesting required to balance the largest maps in franchise history that can accommodate 128 players and specialists such as McKay and Sundance, which benefit from verticality, must have been a nightmare. 
Nightmare. Their hookshot and wingsuit mechanics respectively added much more depth to the sandbox, proving too difficult for DICE to balance. Then you also have to look at the performance, which quickly became the largest issue within the title's later stages of development. Despite all of these issues behind the scenes, Battlefield 2042's portrayal during its marketing cycle painted a much different picture. During EA's quarter three earnings call in 2020, they noted that Battlefield 2042 development was ahead of their internal milestones. The leaks for this game before launch would only add more flame to this fire, signaling praises for this title's innovations and potential. Then, the reveal trailer arrived, which hooked everyone into thinking Battlefield was back with five minutes of what could only be described as a celebration of the franchise, presenting iconic events and innovations that shook the games industry. Even with the questionable reveal of the specialist, players had nothing but excitement for a modern-day Battlefield that increased the scale of its player count, maps, and events, and then Battlefield Portal's reveal would further excite players with the studio Ripple Effect, previously known as DICE LA, developing a sandbox of remastered content from previous Battlefield titles and tools for players to create the server how they wanted to play. Despite the high excitement for Battlefield 2042, there was still a hint of skepticism for one major factor of this game, being the gameplay itself. With only leaks from the alpha and bite-sized fragments from the gameplay trailer being the only instances of raw gameplay for the title. Normally, EA DICE would hold events with creators during the summer before a Battlefield's launch in which they would play the game and interview developers. However, for Battlefield 2042, that was never the case. There were no major events held for creators to either play the game or interview developers. It could be due to the 2019 pandemic, however, that doesn't explain that there was no additional event for creators to even discuss the game. Worries only got worse once DICE announced a one-month delay for the game from October 22nd to November 19th. 2021, where there was still no raw gameplay shown. The only chance for players to see any gameplay was to experience it for themselves in the beta, which would arrive on October 6th. And once the beta arrived, it became obvious why no raw gameplay was shown prior to this beta's launch. The reaction over Battlefield 2042's beta was a quick indicator on how things were going to go, being issues with the game's animations, optimization, UI, level design, vehicle balance, and above all else, the game itself was not fun or engaging. The team at DICE would come out to state that the beta was a three-month-old build. A good amount of the issues found had already been fixed. However, the issues in the beta for the community weren't just from a technical side, but the gameplay one as well. The specialist removed the ability for players to distinguish who friend or foe was, then multiple gameplay systems from movement to combat to vehicle play fell bare bones to previous iterations. The skepticism for Battlefield 2042 immediately turned to criticism, and five weeks after the beta, it was time for the launch. This is the worst Battlefield launch that I have ever been through. I think people were expecting it to feel like a continuation of Battlefield 4, but it doesn't feel like those are in the same world at all. The game is in an unacceptable state. I don't even want to think about what it was like when it was supposed to be released on October 22nd. And this is where we are with 2042. It is sad and disappointing to once again see Battlefield at such a low point, but it doesn't make me angry. Battlefield 2042's launch, in no mistake, was a colossal failure. From what was envisioned to be a title that revitalized the franchise to bring back veterans and expand to New Horizons, everything that could have gone wrong for this game happened. The launch was an unoptimized mess, there was a severe lack of content and features that would have been expected with any Battlefield launch, the gameplay was lackluster, the music was equivalent to nails on a chalkboard, and the cosmetics that were rolling out were far from what the core fans wanted. Then the PR was a nightmare for a multitude of tone-deaf statements by individual or official DICE accounts receiving major backlash with the community response being so toxic that the main subreddit focused on the game had to temporarily shut down. Battlefield 2042 didn't just solidify the fact that DICE's golden era was officially gone, but this game represented everything wrong with current day games as a service titles where every major innovation and system felt undercooked or designed to entice the player to buy microtransactions. 
At even a couple months after launch, the game would be considered dead, with stories covering its bone-chilling development, player counts dropping down to catastrophically low numbers, EA stating Battlefield 2042's disappointing sales brought a loss of $100 million to the company, and then a frustrating delay for the first season of content to the summer just so DICE could spend more time on making the game playable. Journalists would state that due to the one-year pass, the plan was to complete the obligated four seasons of content, then move on to the next title and try again. And there was little reason to think differently. Battlefield as a franchise had collapsed and it felt like there was no way back up. Shortly after the launch of 2042, the leadership at DICE would experience a major reshuffle. Multiple leads such as Oscar Gabrielson, who worked as general manager and vice president at DICE since Battlefield 3, and Fozzie Mesmar, who had worked as studio director at DICE since Battlefield 5, would leave before the end of 2021. Later in the first year of support, more DICE veterans would continue to depart, such as senior design director Daniel Berlin and creative director Large Gustafsson to create their new studio, TTK Games. Many of these high-profile departures from DICE really did solidify the feeling like this was the end of an era for not only the studio, but the franchise. In the same conference call where EA labels Battlefield 2042's disappointing sales as insignificant, CEO Andrew Wilson would also state that the teams working on Battlefields were rethinking the development process from the ground up with a focus on getting the core game right. And the new leadership did provide some backing to that statement. Head of Respawn, Vince Zampella, who is well known for his involvement in creating franchises such as Medal of Honor, Call of Duty, and Titanfall, was placed as the head of Battlefield. Marcus Leto, who is well known for co-creating Halo, was placed as the game director of Ridgeline Studios to lead Battlefield's narrative. The new vice president and general manager of DICE would be Rebecca Kutaz, who worked as a studio manager or managing director on prominent Ubisoft titles such as Assassin's Creed Black Flag and The Division 2. All of these individuals who were assigned to take charge on Battlefield in late 2021 had provided a lot of input on why 2042's reception was overwhelmingly negative and gave hints for what direction the franchise will take in the future and how the culture within DICE itself had changed. The most notable shift in mentality for me was the team's communication to their fanbase, starting with the core feedback loops which provided in-depth blogs while giving a space for the community to voice their opinions on 2042's largest issues being the levels and specialists. Then there were the development updates that would arrive every quarter on the official Battlefield YouTube channel to provide more details on what content is to arrive each season. Later down the seasons, DICE would continue to provide more variety on how they communicate with the player base through podcasts, streams, and community surveys. There were some major missteps along the way, especially when it came to how they handled their relationship with certain content creators, but the efforts throughout the first year to take in and relay community input have been one of the main factors on why Battlefield 2042's live service period feels like an improvement for DICE in comparison to Battlefield 5's despite the minimal amount of content that had arrived over the game's five seasons. The content structure for Battlefield 2042's live service very much followed a slow and steady pacing due to DICE having to fix the base game's stability, core systems, and existing content while also developing new content. Each season would contain one brand new map, one to two map reworks, one new specialist, two to three new weapons, a handful of weapons ported from Portal, and sometimes there would be a new gadget or vehicle, then there would also be a slew of quality of life features or just necessary features in general, in addition to some major gameplay reworks. This content would be spread over the course of three months with mid-season events occurring in between. The main focus for Battlefield 2042 throughout all of its seasons was to keep the all-out warfare fanbase engaged as DICE would immediately cut content support for Hazard Zone and slowly cutting back on support for the Portal game mode as it proved to be too ambitious with the state of the game and the work required in the months ahead. The content rollout was nice in some ways though, as the player at least knows what they're getting in comparison to the inconsistent content schedule seen in DICE previous live services. However, throughout each season, there would always be a point of burnout 
out around the middle. Having one new map was and still is a major gamble on DICE's part, and if the one new map disappoints, it can truly kill a full season for the players. It's already been stated by DICE that the original content plan was to have two all-out warfare maps each season, but they had to reduce it to one due to them needing to rework all of the launch maps. The quality of life updates and reworks done by DICE in recent months have been adequate and have brought more of an impact on why players are coming back to play this game, despite the lack of content. A majority of the changes brought throughout Battlefield 2042's life cycle were to make this game feel like a Battlefield game again. Changes to the gunplay helped it feel somewhat more consistent. The improvements to animations and aesthetics of the specialist made the gameplay experience feel more grounded. Then the class system rework to specialist brought back the structure that this game was lacking. The mid-season events were nothing too special and honestly are just called events so DICE can sell skins under a fear of missing out model. There would be limited time modes such as small conquests and the return of 128 player breakthrough. They were fun but they never felt like a true event in comparison to the live events in popular live service games such as Call of Duty Warzone, Fortnite, or even Apex Legends. Then there's the monetization. The bundles are overpriced going upwards of $20 or even $30, but at least in comparison to competing games, you're allowed to buy each item individually. The skins themselves do try to maintain a milsim aesthetic outside of a couple exceptions. They look cool, but I know for a fact EA and DICE will continue to try to place more expressive cosmetics in the future of this title as microtransactions are main money makers. The Battle Pass is exactly what you'd expect, the system is a lot more similar to Apex Legends with a challenge driven system that adds more each week. The grind isn't all that bad since the challenges aren't really egregious, there are also double XP tokens that count down once you're in a match in contrast to the real time countdown Call of Duty uses. Overall it's just another monetization system, there's nothing really special about it, you know why it's there and it does its job. Now real quick, I personally can't let this video go out without a personal statement on it. The mention of battle passes and even having a functional store with bundles after the launch of 2042 felt offensive. The players deserved a functional and quality experience, and when a game launches in such a poor state, the last thing you should be asking for is more money. Many franchise veterans who purchased the best edition of the game, which included a year one pass or four seasons worth of battle passes with other goodies, waited nearly two years for that promise to be fulfilled. In that time, I would occasionally log into the game for the first two seasons. I never finished those battle passes, and I'm willing to bet that many other players did the game. As a player who felt wronged by the launch and subsequent year after, I feel like those battle passes should be available to all premium owners to finish at any time, and as a token of good faith, all future 2042 battle passes should be granted for free to year one pass owners. If there's one thing I can say, it just felt scummy to know the store was working just fine while the game wasn't. The changes overall have raised the player count on Steam to a steady rate of 8 to 12k players per day, which is not a massive number but a healthier one in comparison to the numbers back at the launch of the game. Then in November of 2022, DICE announced that they were working on a fifth season of content, disputing the early claims that they would cancel support after completing the obligated four seasons. A sixth season was soon to be announced as well shortly before season 5 began, leading to today. In my return to Battlefield 2042, almost two years since its launch, I can confidently state that this finally feels like a Battlefield game. Battlefield 2042 is divided into three experiences, All at Warfare, Hazard Zone, and Portal. Portal was a Master Chief Collection-esque experience developed by Ripple Effect, while All Out Warfare and Hazard Zone were the core Battlefield experience and an extraction shooter developed by DICE respectively. Portal and Hazard Zone have been largely abandoned with All Out Warfare being the main focus for all studios involved for 2042's live service, so we'll start with the other two. Hazard Zone felt like a dead on arrival experience when it first came out and in my opinion has not had meaningful changes since launch, making it easily the most abandoned game mode. The mode fits with the original specialist model, but doesn't change the fact that the overall experience feels bland and uninspired. 
There are some tense moments to be found when you and your squad are in a last second situation to extract drives while another squad rushes to fight you. But in these moments, it still feels few and far between. The extraction rewards don't feel enticing in comparison to the faction rewards and extraction rewards in Call of Duty Warzone's DMZ mode, leaving the overall stakes feeling low. The mode overall is just nothing special and somehow manages to be a greater fumble than Firestorm where I am convinced that the mode even wouldn't have succeeded if it was free to play. It was honestly a good call for this mode to be abandoned early. I wish it never shipped. On the contrary, Portal really deserved more. The concept of the mode is what sold so many people to pre-order the game. This mode easily could have been its own game and become a best of Battlefield collection. However, even when the concept of the mode is phenomenal, the execution has been both underwhelming and problematic. The quality of the ports are subpar with the sounds and some of the animations feeling a step behind the titles they were replicating. Then the custom portal servers relied too much on the belief that the community could do anything that wasn't a 24-7 dad gamer mill sim or an XP farm server. There of course were some highlights such as the Sundance practice range and the 128 rush mode which rose so high in popularity that it became a casual limited time mode for the game. Regardless, I look at Portal each time and think to myself, this really could have been something more special. I hope this mode gets another try. If Portal was rebranded as a free-to-play title with a major expansion every year, this really could be a new dawn for the Battlefield franchise and compete with the likes of Call of Duty in terms of sheer raw content. Then finally, there's our main experience for Battlefield 2042, All Out Warfare, which is truly the shining beacon of the whole package. There are only four made modes with Conquest, Breakthrough, Team Deathmatch, and Rush, and they're all about what you would expect. Conquest is Battlefield's main attraction, being the only mode that features 128 player combat. These larger player count modes have minor changes with some flags having multiple sectors to help spread out the combat spaces. But besides that, this is just a classic sandbox experience we know Conquest to be at a much larger scale. Breakthrough is the same mode we've known from Battlefield 1 and 5 as well, however it's really unbalanced with the game being designed for the attackers to win. DICE even said it themselves that the goal of each breakthrough match is to make sure that the attackers get to the final point. While I get the intention of that, it honestly makes defending a frustrating experience for most of the match. Rush is a surprisingly fun mode and feels more accustomed with the specialists as the smaller scale heightens their effectiveness and Team Deathmatch is your classic brain dead point and shoot the bad guys mode. There are some limited time modes that rotate weekly such as Exodus Conquest which reduces the scale to 64 players and gives you the ability to play on the Portal remasters as well or 128 player Rush. But besides that, that's all the modes that we'll be getting for 2042, which is disappointing the more you think of it, along with the potential. Battlefield is a franchise that is known for a variety of large-scale modes that have captivated gamers time and time again. But it feels like they've stuck with what's safe for Battlefield 2042. Where's Titan Assault? Where's Frontlines? And most importantly, where's Operations? For a game that has no campaign, a narrative-led multiplayer mode like Operations felt like a given to be in this game, but it's just not here. But I guess, what can you expect from a game that is confirmed to not bring back even a server browser? Now onto the maps, there are only 12 maps in All Out Warfare, and after all the maps have gotten their reworks, I have honestly haven't had too many problems with them. The main highlights are the new maps that arrived during post-launch, with Exposure being one of the best DLC maps in recent memory. The map has incorporated a perfect balance of scale and balance for infantry, vehicles, and air support. Stranded brought back a pure meat grinder experience, and Spearhead is a good map in Breakthrough, but it struggles in Conquest due to the massive environmental spaces in between the objectives. Flashpoint is a sniper's dream, solid for those sniper masteries, with Reclaim being perfect for vehicles. While the later maps in the cycle have their flaws, all of the post-launch maps play well, have a lot of cover, feel relatively balanced, and they represent DICE's new mentality when designing their maps in comparison to the launch maps. The DLC maps are designed to follow a rectangular layout to make the full match experience feel a lot more linear and compact. 
Additionally, the pathways are heavily designed to entice players to move into a small to medium sized central zone intended for chaotic close quarters combat. Looking at Exposure, Stranded, Spearhead, and Reclaimed, all of these maps passively guide infantry players to move into the C sector, which all contain these tight cornered spaces for infantry to chaotically battle it out on each other. In comparison, the launch maps followed a box layout to spread the combat out in multiple sectors. What resulted due to this was an immense amount of space in between the objectives, making the overall experience feel more of a walking simulator. DICE did attempt to fix some of this with the addition of the ingenious vehicle call-in system, but it unfortunately doesn't work very well in practice. The launch maps after their reworks definitely play a lot better as DICE did attempt to push their new mentality onto these levels, but maps such as Kaleidoscope and Renewal show that DICE can only do so much to some of the worst maps in franchise history, with them still having a vast amount of open space and a couple of shipping containers in between. Some maps such as Orbital and Breakaway experience a much greater scale in their reworks, receiving brand new points of interest and objective placements, which provided a day and night difference to their original designs, providing that balance of scale and structured chaos within the sandbox. Hourglass is receiving its rework after this video launches, so there's not a single shred of doubt in my soul that when I say that this is the worst map in Battlefield history, and it's up there in FPS history, it really is no surprise that DICE saved this map for last. It's looking promising from the development update as the overall size of the map is being reduced and multiple portions of the map are getting major redesigns. However, we're just going to have to wait and see. While the maps of Battlefield 2042 play well, almost all of them are lacking two major pillars of what make a good Battlefield map atmosphere and destruction. The atmosphere of 2042 is relatively bland to say the least. That's disappointing given the setting of this game is based on a world that has been pillaged by the effects of global warming. There of course are some moments in Battlefield 2042 that leaves you starstruck for its visuals, either it be witnessing the tornado crashing into the rocket on orbital or the chaotic moments you experience in every Battlefield match that feels straight out of a trailer or a movie, DICE still has their moments with 2042. The Frostbite engine still provides beautiful visuals and a chaotic scale that very few games can replicate. However, for Battlefield standards, this is still a mediocre result. If a player goes back to Battlefield 1 or 5, you'll see that awestruck visuals that occasionally stun you in Battlefield 2042 are a casual occurrence. Battlefield 1 is still the best looking Battlefield title in franchise history as you venture through a multitude of environments that had both personality and history. Again, some of those elements do take place in 2042, however some maps feel way too clean. Most of the locations as well are these classified or desolate locations that don't have much of an opportunity to show that society used to be in these locations. It feels like they were designed for us to destroy this clean environment and even then, the destruction for this game just feels so par. Then there's Levolution. There is only one major Levolution event in 2042, which is the rocket's explosion in orbital. Besides that, there's only minor destructive events and they feel like a downgrade in comparison to previous titles and it doesn't help that new titles such as the finals has presented some of the best destruction tech in modern day gaming. But it's definitely a tough situation for the team at DICE when it comes to how much destruction there should be within each map. For positives, destruction looks beautiful and makes each map feel unique. From a technical and a balancing perspective, it must have been an absolute nightmare. The game runs decently now, but for us who played back at launch, we'll remember the excessive number of frame drops that occurred during any point when a building broke down. Additionally, when buildings broke down, the full building was gone, and for a franchise such as Battlefield which promotes good positioning, it's hard to consider which areas should contain high amounts of destruction and which walls are made of bedrock, if only there was a feature that allowed players to build back cover. The final disappointment when talking about destruction is the tornadoes. Each Battlefield since 4 has had that trademark event. Battlefield 4 had Levolution, Battlefield 1 had the Behemoths, then Battlefield 5 had the V1 rocket. Weather events were meant to be the landmark event in 2042, the unstoppable force that could change the tide of Battlefield and create chaos. However, it serves nothing to the game outside of being a cosmetic to the map. 
You look at each map and you see that one area where you can confidently say that it was meant to be destroyed by a tornado, avalanche, earthquake, or storm. There's so much potential to what 2042 set pieces could have been, and it will consistently remain a disappointment to me that DICE weren't able to capitalize on it, and all we can hope is that they managed to improve the design of the maps on all fronts with a new philosophy and potential improvements to the environments and destruction. Now onto the gameplay. I honestly find Battlefield 2042's to be really good outside of some flaws that can't be fixed until the next title. The movement is much faster surprisingly than Call of Duty, which is something I never thought I'd say. You're able to run and not feel punished for it. You could fire your gun while sliding, the ADS time doesn't take 5 years. This has a lot of the elements of the gameplay loop that I wish Modern Warfare 2 had. The gunplay feels good to some extent, the sounds and animations are solid, but definitely not to the level of Modern Warfare 2, which honestly just feels like an unfair comparison because of how talented the weapons team at Infinity War truly are. The netcode has a good amount of issues and the input delay is a frustrating issue that has existed since launch and will probably exist for the rest of the game's life. Then there are some abhorrent balancing issues as when Season 5 began, DICE brought a balance pass to weapons where they would have more bullet spread when you fire them. This was to promote bursting your weapons instead of just being able to laser onto an enemy. However, they only made this nerf for assault rifles, meaning that both LMGs and SMGs are the meta weapons for now. I didn't really even fully understand this change until Danny on PC told me about it on Twitter. Things like this that still make me question DICE's balancing logic at times. Besides that, once the weapon spread changes for LMGs and SMGs arrive as well, I can confidently state that the gunplay is solid and that I feel good when killing an enemy. With that said, that's only half of the infantry experience when playing a Battlefield game because there's a special problem with 2042's loop that I'll come back to in a moment. The vehicle gameplay in Battlefield 2042 is a rough situation overall. I found it to be much harder to destroy a vehicle outside of the use of C5. The intention from DICE is to promote more squad play so taking down a tank is truly fueled by the power of friendship. However, that also gives a lot of room for vehicle players to dominate a match. You can watch tanks decimate infantry in droves, and each time I play on Reclaimed, my experience as an infantry player sours down immediately the second I see a MAV or an M1A5. Choppers are the most annoying vehicles I've ever had the displeasure of going against, as it feels like the pilots are trying to audition for a Fast and Furious film, and transport choppers have these cannons that ruin the entire point of even being a transport chopper. The only vehicle I found to be underpowered is the jets, which feel much weaker in comparison to Battlefield 4's. Dice are taking some steps to improve the balance of vehicles with some much needed reworks to land vehicles and the addition of anti-air turrets, but there's still a good way to go. Regardless, the rock, paper, scissors experience in 2042 is still a lot of fun when all the pieces come together. Running through this large land of space while witnessing infantry, tanks, and choppers battling it out is a truly battlefield-only experience. However, when it's frustrating, it really makes you want to close the game and play something else. Speaking of things that make me want to close the game, Let's just talk about the specialists. Even after the class update, the specialists really don't belong in a Battlefield game. However, there are some positives to be found. The main motivation behind the specialist system, besides microtransactions and making more money, is that players were picking a class more so for their weapon than the class's ability. If you like snipers, you're going to be a scout. If you liked ARs, you were going to play Assault, and so on and so forth. After the class system rework for 2042, DICE found a great middle ground where weapons weren't restricted by a class, but there were passive incentives to use a specific weapon class. Assaults get more ammo if they use an assault rifle, supports get faster draw time with SMGs, engineers get better accuracy when standing or proning with an LMG, then scouts get constant steady scopes when they're using a sniper. The middle ground in my eyes was a perfect way to allow the class system to retain its structure while preventing some of the core flaws that motivated DICE to move on to the specialist system in the first place. Outside of that one positive, all I can ask is that specialists just do not return to Battlefield. Gameplay wise, DICE made some specialists too crazy with Sundance's wingsuit and scatter grenade, McKay's grapple, and Falk's syringe gun. All of these items feel way too powerful for just one character and should have existed as a gadget or pickup item. Had 2042 not received the backlash it got for the specialist system and the game had received more specialists past season 4, DICE eventually would have run themselves thin when it comes to the gadgets future specialists could have gotten. The same way games like Rainbow Six Siege were new operators feel more outlandish than the last one. 
The gadgets are too much and should have not been locked to a specific character, which also affects the cosmetic side of 2042. Both factions have the same exact characters and it gets really distracting. Battlefield 5 had a perfect system that kept faction uniqueness while providing room for unique characters that could be customized. No matter how many fixes the class system will receive, no matter how many cosmetics DICE puts on the shop and battle pass, 2042 will always be the Clone Wars. That said, 2042 overall is a better game than it was 18 months ago, but that's not really saying much, or anything if we want to be completely honest. This game was meant to be a platform for the franchise, a response to a new era of live service games, and the title that brought longtime fans back to playing Battlefield will bring new players along for the ride for many years to come. Now, it's just a title that managed to convince some core fans to come back when a multitude of new and existing titles managed to take the audience EA and DICE so hoped to attract. In the grand scale of the gaming industry, 2042 will be remembered as a reflection of the state of the industry, a forced, rush, and abusive live service game motivated by nothing but profits to the point to where the creatives of the game could not create a proper game around it. While Battlefield 2042's comeback is commendable in the sense that many players gave up on the game immediately after launch, some managed to return after a sour first, second, third, fourth, and honestly, pretty much even a 20th sour impression, this game should still serve as a lesson for why live services are a plague to the industry. It's a soulless, predatory model that aims to appease executives and investors while leaving its passionate developers and core fans behind. No matter what happens next for 2042, the game is, and will always be, the end of an era for DICE and Battlefield. Battlefield 2042 still has a sixth season of content to go, and there's no shot of a doubt in my mind that this may be the end. There's no more maps to rework, the major systems that need to be reworked have been complete, and similar to Battlefield 5 and Battlefront 2, the game is not at a good enough state for DICE to close up shop and move on to the next title while we all wonder how successful the game could have been if it launched this way today. When it comes to the next title, there's a good amount of information for what's taking place. As stated earlier, the franchise as a whole will be led by Vince Zampella. The next title will feature a single player campaign led by Marcus Leto Studios Ridgeline Games. Then DICE will continue to work on multiplayer and Ripple Effect will be working on a separate Battlefield game. EA had described the next title to be something completely new and part of me is worried about that decision. According to Tom Henderson, the game is slated to arrive in 2042, giving the next title roughly two to three years of development time. In the current market of gaming, that's just not enough time to develop a AAA title anymore. Furthermore, Battlefield 2042 is finally entering a decent state to where I believe the next title should more so build on this game's gameplay foundation while fixing the fundamental mistakes made. DICE needs to bring back some of the core pillars that made Battlefield the franchise it is today, such as the class system, server browser, factions. If it wants to be a live service, it needs to give us more than one map per season. I would go further to state that the game should return to 64 players or at least scale down to 80. 128 players was a fun experiment, however it created a massive hurdle to DICE from a gameplay and technical perspective to where I believe it hurts the game more than it helps it. And finally. DICE needs to stop following trends and focus on being Battlefield. There's no need for a Battle Royale, Extraction Mode, or a 5v5 mode. Make Battlefield excel at what it does best. When people say they want a remastered version of Battlefield 3 or 4, it's really not a joke. However, this is a new era for DICE, and as a whole, the team is far different than the one that made some of our favorite Battlefields bring a whole new vision and direction for how the franchise should move forward. Battlefield 2042's live service at least gives us some indication that DICE do know what the fans want from Battlefield game. However, I do believe that the most important aspect DICE could give us with its next title is transparency. I want to see that fans and content creators of 2042, regardless if they were heavily critical of the game or not, 
are involved with the next title to some capacity. We can't have another title where fans are left out until the damage has been done. We can't have another title solely driven by profits in sacrifice of the principles that made this franchise what it is. DICE is at a low point, and truly only has one more shot to bring back the glory of Battlefield. While this game will be remembered by many as a failure on a technical scale comparable to Cyberpunk 2077, it will also be remembered by few as an attempt to fix a game corroded by predatory business practices. While I can understand the feelings of betrayal and abandonment on our financial purchases of 2042, I can't help but wonder, is this truly the end of Battlefield as we know it, or is it an important failure on the journey to another golden era?